Good evening. I am Dr. Sundi Kaita, and this is Real Talk, History as a Weapon for Black Liberation. And today, our guest is the great Jared Ball. I mix what I like. I don't know if I can get the energy up like he does, but I mix what I like. As you know, Dr. Ball is a father and a husband. And after that, he is a professor of communication studies at Morgan State University. He is the founder and curator of I Mix What I Like, and he is, uh, which is a multimedia hub. And he is one of the founders of Black Power Media. And he recently published The Myth and Propaganda of Black Buying Power, a piece that we will discuss. So let me bring on Dr. Jared Ball. Comrade, hey. brother, how are you? How are you? I'm as good as could be expected. It's a pleasure to be on your show. Thanks for having uh, me. It's a pleasure to be able to return the favor the numerous times <laughs> you, you had me on. And it's a pleasure to be part of the Black Power Media yeah. Network. Right on. So my brother, um, you know, I've, I'm married to a psychologist. And so I've kind of learned a few tricks of the trade. So I always start with a biographical sketch. And so uh, I, I want you to begin to kind of excavate your background for us. And, uh, you know, I think it's, people probably know a lot about you, mm -hmm. but I still think it would be important to delve into some of the ways in which you became Dr. Jared Ball, <laughs> right? So tell us. Uh, when and where were you born and how did your class background place and time in which you went through your formative years, uh, how did that influence and impact the development of your political consciousness? So again, I, I appreciate it and, and I'll, 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 I'll try to be as brief as I can and then, you know, if, if, any if any elaboration is needed we can uh but i was born uh, uh september 28 1971 in washington dc and uh and i always like to say that for people who know dc uh they'll appreciate what this means i was but i was born because it says in some ways it says a lot uh and in some ways in my case it doesn't uh tell the full story but i was born actually in sibley hospital um, which again, for people familiar with DC will know that that is not where, uh, most DC residents, certainly black DC residents would have been born, uh, particularly at that time where it would have been a DC general. Uh, but I was born in Sibley, not only because, uh, I think less so that my mother is a white Jew, but more so because my black father had uh labor union insurance and i think that's what got me into this into, into sibley hospital and i also like to to bring that up because i think it's interesting that i've i've um i think only once been back and in all the years of either living in or around dc i couldn't even tell you where that hospital is um uh again people familiar with dc you know i, I like i couldn't tell you how to get there so tucked away in in uh upper northwest dc so again people familiar with that area will know uh that that is the the more white and affluent part of of town uh but at the same time we didn't have a lot of money so uh i you know i grew up uh, my early years started in uh, a small apartment in 14th street northwest my parents divorced shortly uh maybe a year or so after i was born uh and I always think it's funny, we stayed in Northwest DC for the first few years of my life, but either in a small apartment or living in a room in someone else's house. So I always, you know, my mother, I'd like, you know, I think is, I always jokingly refer to her as the bougie proletariat, uh, 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 very bougie aspirations but never having any money. So she would not have wanted us to, to leave Northwest DC, but we had to stay in Northwest DC again, living in an attic at one point, living in, you know, like in, 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 in you know, 
I think it's kind of stressful situations. But anyway, and then we moved out to where where I end up and uh, uh, end up living now, actually in uh, Columbia, Maryland, which was at the time one of the more prominent planned cities uh, in the country, and was supposed to be seen as some racial and class utopia. Uh, but, uh, is anything but that. And, uh, uh, and, and I grew up in, in what I was literally a suburban section eight. Uh, so we had section eight housing of a uh, small apartment, um, uh, subsidized housing really. And, uh, uh, and that was it. So I grew up in a, in, you know, raised by my mother with a very labor communist, uh, civil rights background. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, who introduced me into all the radical traditions and encouraged uh, that I engage them. And uh, so anyway, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's, I guess the shortest version I can give, you know, so, but. Uh, um, anyway, I do have some yeah. follow-up questions, but. Yeah, yeah, come on. What, yeah, but there's fine. a piece of it that, that that's intriguing. You, sure. you know, uh, I've done a lot of work on Soul City. In fact, I've been mm -hmm. working on a book on uh, Floyd McKissick and Soul City. And so mm -hmm. there was um, an act passed in 66 or 67 that created planned communities. Mm -hmm. And so city came under that act and Columbia, Maryland, I believe was one of those cities. Oh, wow. Yeah, that, that, that's what, because you know, the United States, you don't have a, there's not a history of planned cities in terms of, uh, government support. And so it, it sounds, I'll have to go back and look, but I do know there was a city in Maryland for sure. And that rings a bell with me. Um, it, 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 would, I, it, it would almost, it would almost have to be Columbia. I mean, Columbia is, is, is in, in a sense, like that's what it's known for being one of the, the more prominent and uh, uh, yeah. uh, James Rouse put it together. Uh, and it was, the idea was uh, again, it's, it's white men putting this mm -hmm. together. It is. It is. With, oh, so with city was the only black planned city to, to get yeah. funded as part of that act. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, what, what what they did here, what, what well, what they would have considered themselves as having done here is not, obviously not creating black community uh, towns per se, but they did intentionally reach out to you know the reason my in my neighborhood, for instance, where I spent most of my time growing up out here, was almost exclusively black. And most of the residents were either from D.C. or Baltimore. And as they were being, you know, this was part of gentrification efforts, slow motion gentrification efforts, of course. And then what they did was they created these uh, 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 villages, what they call villages here. And in each village, they have a, a, a village center that, was, that, at least at the time when I was growing up, had a grocery store, some restaurants, barbershop all of that. And the idea was you put this so that all the poor communities could be within walking distance to these amenities. Uh, uh, and then as you go out through, you know, uh, you know, not long, not, not great distances at all, but small concentric circles going outward, you get, you know, uh, uh, apartments, some, some townhouses, some single family homes, some bigger single family homes, and then even going farther out, some farms and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, it was, it was, uh, um, and even in some research for a project I never followed up on, it, you know, it, it, in my personal experience, I, I experienced what I would consider to be the failure of that project. And it, as I'm watching what has happened here ever since, it has completely failed. But the, in terms of even the fantasies they promoted in terms of this, this racial class utopia, uh, but, but very early on, it was being perceived as not working. Um, particularly by by black communities uh, or residents here, um, but anyway, so so it, you know, but it it I, I don't know. I think it produced a, a, a very interesting experience um, that for me, uh, and I know sometimes it see, and I understand it seems odd, but for me it was a very logical conclusion. It began. It, it was the beginnings of a very logical conclusion for for where I have ended up. Um, so yeah, that, no, that, that's just fascinating. Um, you're the first person I've met from a planned community. I think yeah. they only did seven or seven of them. Yeah. I don't know how many, I mean, I know yeah. I, the, the, I always know that they started comparing us to rest in Virginia, which I know was that's, another that's one. one. That's one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, 
but and I don't know how many of the other ones there have been. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, you know, it, it's it's just it's just wild. It's just wild. Well, it's cute because I got a long email from a brother that's working with uh, Floyd McKissick's son and uh, Lou Myers, uh, the son-in-law, to try and uh, reboot Soul City. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, All right. <laughs> yeah. Right on. I mean, and it's funny because, you know, uh, 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 and Ivan did a little video for our channel uh, a couple, uh, I don't know, a couple months ago where I went back to my old neighborhood over on the other side of, of, of Columbia. Ah. And and it was it was it, it, it was funny because all of in a microcosm it is all of what what happens everywhere else. So you mm-hmm. have and it's still you still have all these you know black and brown you know uh, uh, populations piled up in this community. The brother that they had a, a brother. It was so perfect in terms of the the, the work we all do here. This, this brother from somewhere in the Caribbean was the private security guard that was hired by the owners of the property to police the area. And I ended up asking him. I was like, "Why are you?" I was like, "It's it's that deep." And he was like, "Oh yeah, you know it's, it gets you know because he was he was he was, saw me walking around filming. And he you know I, he, yeah. I saw that he was starting to you know follow me a little bit. So I, as he came up, I just was like, "Look, look, I, I grew up in that building. I'm just doing a little video." He was like, "Oh, okay." And I said, "And I was like, why are you even here?" And he was like, "Well, you know, it's it's, it's crime and there's even shootings." And I was oh, like, "Shootings?" Wow. I was like, "Shootings?" I was like, "Yeah." He was like, "Yeah, yeah." I said, "Oh, wow." I said, "It's it's you know." And he said, "And I said, you know, uh, I don't remember any of that happening uh, quite that. I don't know, maybe once in my childhood or something." But but like you know, uh, and he was like, "Oh no, well that was back in the day when it was you know, yeah, nice." Yeah, yeah, and yeah, now yeah. they've actually the they've actually labeled this medicine. area. Yeah, yeah, they've actually labeled that area a blighted community. Uh, oh, wow. Um, and 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 uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, so I mean, it's it's I don't know. It, it's a perfect microcosm because it's it's you it, you have all the 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 poorer communities, the blacker communities mm-hmm. piled up in there. They 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 took out the grocery store, uh, took out the bank. They put, of course, the liquor store is still there. Yeah, the no, gas station course. is still there, and then they put in a police substation. So, so they increase police, the 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 uh, county police, and then they've hired more security on the, for your private, private security, security to even work separately within this 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 neighborhood. And when you see it, it's literally one street. <laughs> I mean, it's what? not even. <laughs> yeah, it's one street, and then right down the street are are townhouses, and right up the street are newer townhouses and a new high school that didn't exist when I was growing up. So it's like this. It's it's literally a, a it's a complete literal microcosm of the broader problem they just it's just very you know uh, compacted uh uh on this it's literally one street (laughs) (laughs) yeah crazy absolutely absolutely so brother you you've got this um interesting background especially for a contemporary academic and an an African American, and you're particularly your age range, right? And w- what I'm getting at is your, your class background as a working class person. There's not a lot of working class people in academia, and there certainly aren't a lot in uh, a lot of black working uh, academics from the working class in your age cohort. I think that my cohort is probably the last one that had a significant number of people who came mm. out of the, the working class. And so, hmm. you, you, you know, and then, of course, you're raised by a single mother, white mother, but you did four years, or as you put it, four, four of, a four-year sentence mm-hmm. in the Navy. And so uh, that's a unique background. And then you come to the professoriate out of study groups and an activist background. So in the basketball lingo that's applied to uh, Kevin Durant and uh, and Porzingis, you're a unicorn. (laughs) 
yeah, uh, 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 <laughs> I'm definitely not paid like those unicorns. Yeah, uh, no, so we can start with that way. that distinction. Um, no, that's interesting, and I honestly I would have thought. I mean, that's something I would want us to follow up on at some point, or I need to follow up on yeah. the, the, your point about there being fewer. You're saying there are fewer in 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 younger generations. You're saying there are fewer Black American academics coming from a working class background than than mine or your generations. Absolutely, absolutely. Wow. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess it makes sense. Are the just, children you know, of uh, faculty. Mm. You know, I mean, if you you know, if you just think back and look at your student cohorts and look at the graduate students that you have and where they come from, you can see a sharp class turn 20 years ago mm. um, and even before in some ways. And I think it's a meaningful transition and that it explains uh, the death of black studies. Mm. I should say it's on life support. But what, what I wanted to get at with you is, mm. um, a, a question, I can't remember how long ago, but it probably had to be in the 80s. I picked up this book that I occasionally return to, and it's by uh, these two white cats. And it, it, it really is a, a white book, right? So these two guys, they're working class academics. And uh, the title of the book is uh, Strangers in Paradise, Academics from the Working Class. So they get 24 people who are of working class background to write biographical sketches and to particularly talk about uh, their, you know, the, the, their experience as working class academics. Now, mm. one of the big flaws is, of course, is 24 white folks. I mean, yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> You know, well, I mean, you what know you better saying? than anybody. Even, <laughs> even, even, even the white labor left has a problem with race. They have a problem. I mean, you know, they, I mean. they have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, funny. so it's all white folks. But what the the two authors discover in these narratives is that uh, there's a deep sense of alienation amongst mm. these twenty four folk that they they, they do they. They have a sense of not belonging. They, and more importantly, they don't want to necessarily fit in, right? And so they have this, uh, this identification, a kind of lingering identification with their working class background. And so my question to you, does any of that alienation, um, feeling more comfortable with... Uh, like in my case, when I run into a person that has a working class background, there's a different vibe yeah. in, in academia. And there's just a, there's a connection there that generally it, it flows along race lines, but it, it transcends race. When I look at the white folks that I connect with, like Bob McChesney, you know, mm -hmm. working class background. Mm -hmm. yeah. So do you experience some of the things or any of all of the things that they describe in this book in terms of a sense of alienation from academia and its bourgeois folk who dominated and a, and a lingering sense of connection to the brothers so that you hold up a bottle of Uncle Nears. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you know, I'm about, you know, it's within arm's reach, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so, so the, the, so there's there's at least two quick points about my mother that that I think are important and relevant to this question. One is that, uh, and I know, and I get, and I get it, it, it the oversimplification, and I definitely get the distinction over time. But she really is born, in, you know, in, in the 1930s and raised mm. in 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 the in the in 1933 and raised in in uh, first in the Bronx and then in Brooklyn back when they still didn't even have paved roads like that's the brooklyn she remembers like horse drawn wow. buggies and whatnot like you know carts and whatnot like um but she really grew up at a time where where in that instance jews did not see themselves as white mm -hmm. and her group of jews saw themselves as having to be revolutionary and she did come out of you know communists um you know her 
her mother had had been born in what was then Palestine and and then kicked out of Palestine because they didn't agree with the Zionists and the and and being they were cool with the Arabs and 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 they were literally and they felt betrayed by the Zionists that that tricked them out of Europe so like so like that was the energy that flowed Okay. And then she came out of the labor movement. I mean, like, you know, uh, and one of the things that attracted her to my father was his involvement in the in the labor movement, not just the civil rights movement, but specifically the labor movement Ooh. with the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists as a co-founder and an AFSCME. Um, uh, so so the, the, my whole upbringing and like and then she raised me with a lot of mythologies. So, I mean, like she never I never even though he wasn't in the house, I never heard one ill word about my father until I think I was well into my 20s. Um, I mean, I had figured things out, obviously, but she would never have said. So I just was raised with all this. You you, you have to be in the struggle and you have to support working people. I remember like one of the most vivid memories I have was was being at a dinner with some relatives. And one of one of her cousins said, you know, something about leaving, not leaving a, a tip or not caring about the waitress or something like that. And my mother snapped, like, like mm. snapped, mm. like, em, like yeah. embarrassingly yeah. loud. Like, how dare you? Like, you can't. And it's always like a, a burning memory for me. Like, you cannot working people are it. So that was the whole thing. So even though she raised me to always speak proper English and, you know, that was where the bougie proletariat thing was, you know, and so people often assumed whether it was my complexion or the way I speak that I grew up in a, in a, in a, in a, in a class that I didn't grow up in. Um, but after that initial, uh, you know, barrier, I mean, yes, to the, to the, to the question that, that has been a lot of what I've experienced in terms of, alienation within the academy i mean i've even been asked literally by colleagues about my affinity for talking to the janitorial staff and to the, to the, <laughs> to the non-phds in our yeah. department you know yeah. like yeah. you're always yeah. hanging out with the technicians and the the cleaning crew and you always you know you always you know, and, and 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 i'm like well yeah i mean you know i mean you know anyway so i uh um Anyway, and like John, the late John Thompson said, man, uh, the coach of Georgetown, I never forget for something he used to say on the radio all the time. He said, the worst things that have been done to me have been done to me by people wearing suits. Mm. So like whenever mm. he was asked about, you know, black men with their sagging pants and the this and the that and all that, he'd be like, yeah, I understand. And I want people to dress a certain way and I have a preference and a bias too. But the worst things done to me have been by people wearing suits, not overalls and jeans and you know yeah, yeah you know stuff like yeah. that so um anyway so that that's that's i mean yeah i mean even you know like when i used to be out more and would want to to you know um drink or engage in other activities mm. it was with the so-called working or lower class people that i always have felt most comfortable and had the most fun um and, you know, so anyway, I mean, uh, I don't, you know, so I've always, I've never done well in like, uh, and it, you know, and it's impacted my career, frankly. I think part of it, on the one hand, to be honest, I don't think my work has been um, stellar enough to get over some of these hurdles. But at the same time, Ooh. I just socially and politically am not comfortable in, um, you know, traditional academic settings, you know, the, 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 the socializing you're supposed to do the networking. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, you know, the, the yeah. wine drinking. I hate yeah. wine. I don't like hors d'oeuvres. I don't eat cheese. I don't. No, I don't hate so like, wine. I'm, so I want to put that on. The I record. do hate wine. I, I, yeah, I don't like wine. I've never liked wine, but, but, uh, and I hear you, but just so my point is, I just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. you know. Yeah. But no, no, no. There's a certain class that drinks wine a certain kind of way. Right, right, right. Yeah, right, I get, right, right, I get right, right, that point. Right. But yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But yeah, uh, so yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I, I think that we don't explore that a- enough. And I was intrigued by the, the the labor emphasis. And two two things struck me. One, I've uh, got a student who uh, took my Black uh, Liberation course, and she came out of St. Louis and had done some work with the fight for 15. So mm-hmm. the idea was that she was going to see how many black liberation organizations in St. Louis had been involved in the fight for 15, right? Mm-hmm. Because overwhelmingly the workers who 
are leading the strikes and the uh, and the leadership of the fight for 15 movement are black folk. Mm. And she discovered two things that I find interesting. The first was that when Ferguson initially kicked off, people, black folks who worked for McDonald's and other fast food places and were part of the fight for 15, they were some of the first activists to go into Ferguson and start organizing. The second thing that's interesting mm -hmm. is that only the organization for Black Struggle, an organization I used to be a, a, a member of when I was in St. Louis area, had connections to the fight for 15. None of the other black radical nationalists and certainly not the civil rights type groups had connections to that basic labor struggle. And, and it just hit me that uh, we really de-emphasized labor even more than we did in the 60s era. Well, yeah, I mean, right. you you make a great point. I'm, as I'm thinking very quickly, uh, just in terms of my own experience, uh, be it I, I, admittedly, in terms of grassroots politics, I was much more involved with nationalist politics than labor politics, and there wasn't a lot of overlap. You're right. I mean, not, I mean, and and uh, and and oftentimes, you know raising uh, labor would be seen as raising class, which is seen as being Eurocentric, which is, a whole, you know, leads you start yeah. leading down a oh, hole. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I and, and that's a major problem. You're exactly right. I mean, that's, that's a great point. Uh, yeah. so. <laughs> and it's a, it's a, it's a problem. It's a, I mean, it's a it's, real it's problem. It's a actually. problem. It's, it's a problem. That's so a I think about that. how do you end up, in the field of communications. What is it that attracted you to that area of study and, and work? Because, I mean, you, you your resume in terms of the uh, programs and the work that you've done in the field, you know, is uh, at the top of the heap. But how do oh, you I don't know get about attracted? That. I don't... Uh, no, look, brother, look, look, brother look. I'm a critical reader and, <laughs> and I'm just going to say, uh, you know, I'm not talking about uh, quanti quantity. Mm -hmm. I'm talking quality. Okay. I'm talking quality. But so, so the point being, how did how'd you get to that? Because it's not a field that initially had a lot of black folk, but it's a field that you share with Malefi Asante. That's funny, right? That's yeah, funny. that's real funny. <laughs> and and um, oh, that's that's really funny that you said that because uh, I you know some of his early work uh, in that field um, uh, I thought was was really good actually, it was. and I it used was. it. Yeah. Uh, and it, but but he's obviously not known for that. Um, there's uh, so 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 because I'm on your show and which is titled Real Talk. I, I I don't know if I've ever answered this question this honestly uh, publicly before. The only reason I ended up getting a PhD in communication is because well well first just backing up a real quick in undergrad at Frostburg State University I didn't know exactly what I was going to do I had, I didn't have a plan and and I've never really been good at planning out uh, my life. Uh, and I remember one of my professors, one of my history professors, uh, uh, this white guy, but he was he was one of the fairer ones that let, you know, you know, kind of let yeah. me do my thing in the class. I saw I just started peeping. For some reason, I peeped his schedule, his life schedule one semester. And, hmm. you know, and I started thinking about because he was talking about he was well, going to go what on do you a mean his life schedule because because he, because he, during the semester, I think it was it was uh, for like maybe Thanksgiving break or something like that. There was a, a break coming and he said something about he was going to go away. And then I, and from that, just him saying something that simple, I thought for a second, well, wait a minute, what is your what is your actual life like? I never really thought about a professor's life. Right, right, right. So I was, you know what I mean? So when I started thinking about his schedule, I was like, you know, so so he's got this flexible schedule. 
He's he's <laughs> he's going away for this for this holiday. He's not working over the winter. He doesn't work on spring break. He doesn't work over the yeah. summer. Now now I didn't always. Yeah, yeah, now, yeah. I came to learn some of the realities, you know, later on. Right, right. right. But at the time, I was like, wait a minute, man. Uh, cause, cause I had already been in the military. I had already done real work and I, and I was just like, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that for the rest of my life. So I got to find another hustle. So I started thinking that was what really started me thinking about academia. And I, that's when I started, I started thinking about, well, well, if this is his life, I can, uh, uh, so longer story short, by the time I, I came out of a, a grad school at Africana, um, the Africana studies of research center under Dr. James Turner. Uh, um, it was Dr. Todd Stephen Burroughs, my main man. Ooh. When I told him, I called him one day and I said, Howard University, this is what they told me, lost my application to the PhD program in history. I had applied to the PhD program in history at, at Howard. And when I didn't hear back from them, I called them. I was like, what's, you know, and they said, we never, we don't, we've, they literally told me on the phone, we've lost your application. We didn't, we don't, we don't know what happened to your application. So they never ruled on it. I never got, obviously I never went. So I called Todd and he, and, and he, he was, he had gone through the program at, at University of Maryland uh, College of Journalism. And he put me in touch with one of the faculty members there and we just met and she said, I think you'd be a good fit. You should apply and boom, 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 boom. I ended up going there and that was it. So it was never this desire to be a PhD in communications. It was like, I just want to get a PhD. And if I'm, and if the Howard thing fell through and I honestly didn't plan it out. So like, I, I, I maybe I was arrogant. That's probably true. I was probably arrogant thinking I was definitely gonna get into Howard. I was like, they can't not let me in. And then, you know, so I, so so in that interim, I taught for a year at a at a public charter school, a high school in D.C., which is its own experience and and definitely told me I want to be a university professor because high school teaching is way too hard. Oh, brother, <laughs> brother, brother. <laughs> this is real talk. <laughs> I mean, that was it. I was, you know, and then I, you know. And then I also understood where I was politically and that I'm not adept at playing certain games. So uh, I feel like this was going to be a good way for me to relatively be able to be honest politically, have a, a, a sustainable career. I didn't expect to get tenure. I didn't expect to to stay in one place. I thought I'd be bouncing around. I thought I would be much more, honestly, I thought I'd be much more of a militant radical activist um, than I turned out to be. Um, so, uh, um, you know, but anyway, so that was really it. It was not, there was not some grand plan and there was not some lifelong desire for this. It was just, you know, so. But, you know, that tells me something because you, 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 one of the people that I would describe as historically minded, right? There, mm. there are some people, there's actually some historians who don't have a sense of how history moves. <laughs> so that shit is always just a little flat stuff. But you're one of the people that understands history has an innate sense of it. And so that makes sense that you had an interest in the discipline at one point. And that well, probably I mean, has I, continued that in terms of your reading. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, well, I think what I had an interest in th f beginning uh um really in the military was was reading radical history that would answer the questions that i was having about you know personal questions and i think a lot you know the late renoko rashidi i i used to listen to uh a lot of lecture tapes and one of, i remember him telling this story on a tape years ago long story short was that that um he he had this grander allegory but his point was that for a lot of black men in in academia they be they embark on uh, on that career with the initial purpose of answering questions about their relationships with their fathers. That's what he said. And mm. I was like, damn, was he talking to me? Mm. Um, like I felt like on that lecture tape, he was talking right out of my car mm. stereo okay. to me. And that was exactly, I, I hadn't thought of it consciously, but that was exactly what I had been doing. I was, I was trying to get answers to questions about, um, uh, my father's experience, how that was informing my own experience, questions that my mother wasn't able to answer, mm -hmm. questions white academia and white liberal, you know, media can't answer. Right, right. 
<laughs> and and only that black radicalism and and the black radical tradition through black studies in particular is what has really be, answered all of my questions. So when when I left Africana Center, I was like, I don't care what I get a PhD in. It's going to be part of this radical Africana tradition. Yeah, so if it's yeah. got communication on the label, if it's got history on the label, I don't really that's give right. a damn what it does. It's it, it's going to be you know so that's why i've even right, in right. communication studies i buck I, you know i had a, a struggle with it with the administration and the faculty at, at maryland uh within traditional communication studies you know i've i've, I've had a very you know uh, isolated uh, marginal experience because th their traditional questions and theories don't answer the questions the way i that i have um so anyway so so you know that's why I like the the labels don't mean as much because right. the, the content is almost always going to be you know heading in one in a certain trajectory. No, no, I I, I sincerely hear you in, in that regard. And in fact, I would argue that the people who become the best scholars are those that uh, cross those disciplinary boundaries, and that black studies is at the end of a, of the day. It's it's both the pooling together of ideas, concepts, theories, and methodologies from other disciplines. And mm -hmm. it is the generation of new theories, paradigms, and methodologies from within Black studies. So that it's, uh, you know, James Stewart, I think, is, is correct. It's a trans discipline. Absolutely. And I remember even Fanon had that line about, he said, I leave questions of disciplines to the botanists. <laughs> 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 I was like, well, you know. That is that is good. We're right that on. Is, that is good. <laughs> so, I, I want to um, let me let me make sure I'm, I'm I'm touching all the bases here. Yeah. So we're talking about reading. That, that's that's what we were talking about. Oh right, right, and right. So, right. you know, when I look at my life, I can identify certain texts that had profound influences on me. You know, uh, the first issue of the Black Scholar. Not necessarily what was in it, but that it came out and it spoke to me when I was 16 in a, in a profound way. And I knew when I finished that issue that I wanted to be an intellectual, a black intellectual. But I was so embarrassed that I, I, I deliberately mispronounced intellectual, right, so that people would not take me so serious. Mm. because I felt self-conscious about wanting to be an intellectual, right? But the Black scholar did it, and then Black Awakening in Capitalist America Man. Uh, was confirmatory. Uh, it spoke to my life, and it gave me a vision of the movement that I was involved in, because my first job was as a community organizer. So what are the books? What are the texts that took you from Jared Ball in the making to Dr. Jared Ball, I mix what I like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I, I, I know you were going to ask that, and I, I, I still, even with a little bit of time to think about it, I can't. The first one is always that that uh, probably even came a little later was was Blood in My Eye, uh, ah. George Jackson. Um, to this day, that is. I mean, I still go back to it. It, it. It's almost always within arm's reach. It's torn to pieces. I mean, I, I need a new copy. I, that 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 one. Yeah. I mean, Malcolm obviously the the autobiography and then all those speeches, the the Pathfinder books. I remember I got all those back in the day. You know, when I was in the Navy and and um, uh, but but it was blood in my eye. Maybe to this day, more than any one book. That. I don't know. It just. It just. It, it it just speaks so much to 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 what I have ever would want to be like my energy what I would want to see yeah. you know happen I like I I don't know it's, um um I don't know I mean you know I I, I mix what I like is borrowed from I write what I like which I know was you know a compilation mm -hmm. a posthumous for for Steve Biko but yeah, but yeah. Uh, uh you know off of his Frank Talk columns uh, uh I write what I like and all of that so that and that had you know he had a tremendous impact on me um I don't you know I I I, I mean there's just so many I mean I don't I, it it's 
but the, the George Jackson is the first one that comes to my mind. It's it's um, I mean, but a lot of like all of the 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 so called seminal, you know, the greats. I mean, I, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I I tried to read Wretched of the Earth in the Navy, uh, and 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 couldn't do it. I had to put it down. I couldn't. I I, I wasn't ready for it. Couldn't handle it. Came back to it years later. Um, I still feel that way about Sylvia Winter's work. Just, just yeah. that just crossed my mind. For instance, like, well, well, you, you're I, mean, not I don't know if I'll one. ever be ready. Yeah, I don't know if I'll ever be ready for that. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, she's she's heavy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sophia Bakari's The War Before. I don't know exactly when that I got that book, but that, like, I, that still is 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 Asada's, uh, you know, um, uh, autobiography. Um, and then a lot of the like a lot of my early stuff was was those lecture tapes, man. Dr. Clark, mm. Doc mm-hmm. Ben, man, Francis yeah, Chris yeah, Welsing, yeah, yeah. Marimba Ani, even even when she was Donna Richards. Okay, okay. Uh, you know, one of I still got a tape somewhere when when, she, when, when she's labeled as Donna Richards. Um, anyway, I don't know. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I'm probably missing a bunch, but uh, I mean, I, I mean, all you know, like Marx, Lenin, Mao. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you know, these folks like, I mean, ha- continue to mean a lot, uh, you know, um, but, uh, yeah, any, I, I, you know, no, I don't know. I, I always yeah. want to know what people read that influenced them. And, you know, as I've, as I constantly ask this question, what I, what I find is this, even when I'm dealing with someone who is, uh, say, in their 30s, the influences tend to be the works that was published in the 60s and the 70s. Mm-hmm. Now, if they're really into the tradition, right, they, they'll go back and they'll pull up some stuff from the 30s, some Du Bois, some C.L.R. James. Mm-hmm. Um, but the what we call the high tide of the Black Liberation Movement, the 60s, that there's something about that work that uh, like the music itself has staying power. You you, you know what I mm-hmm. mean? No, absolutely. Um, in a way that I'm not sure the, the stuff that was produced from 1984 has, uh, I can't think of that many pieces that, you know, uh, has the same kind of power. Now, there's some really good stuff. Right. That's a good that's Sterling Stucky, slave community. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of good stuff, but it's not like the stuff from the high tide. Mm-mm. That's deep. I I'm my memory is terrible, but I and I'm I I I, I have to come back and, and and probably look at the chat later and get get corrected yeah. on some of this, but but uh that's a really interesting point, and maybe it's because the the the, the distance from the actual in, in, engaged struggle uh, has something yeah, to do with yeah. it. Uh, I, I, I think um, that that's it. Um, hmm. Certainly, it's before the the discourse turn. Uh, you know, I think that that postmodern stuff has a has has some negative impact. But anyway, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. No, I hear I you. Wanna, I hear you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I want to come back and. Um, couple more questions that we'll wrap up and then we'll open for the audience. But one of the things, uh, two pieces that you had done previously kind of intrigued me and I wanted to at least uh, follow some breadcrumbs into those pieces and what they have to say about the current moment. So one is... um, this piece you did in Living Colors, a black man with a white mother examines the concept of multiracial identity, past, present, and future. And what what I'm intrigued by is that, you, you know, I, I, I hate to be in the position of referencing Black Lives Matter, but you know, you, you sometimes you just can't you, you can't avoid stuff, you know. Mm. Um, but you know that slogan that they had kind of adapted, unapologetically black, which I always thought was an awful slogan. It always reminded me of uh, 
Jamil Alamine's critique of what he called militant blackism. Mm. But but anyway, that that slogan, uh, unapologetically black, is a kind of ubiquitous thing now amongst black folk. And I'm wondering how we we exist in a moment where that's quite prominent, but at the same time, um, these notions of biraciality and hybridity still loom large, especially in academia and amongst the black professional technical managerial class. So I'm wondering if you can share your findings from that initial piece you wrote and then comment on the present situation in that regard. Well, so uh, so shout out to Lori Robinson. She she facilitated the the um, that that article uh, after um, uh, she I and and uh, uh, her husband had a conversation about my life in politics. She was like, "Wow, we should follow up on some of that and and do something with that." So she she ended up putting me in touch with Dream Hampton and Jared Sexton. Uh, and uh, um, another uh, uh, couple of uh, uh, another woman and the brother, like a couple other people to to interview uh, and to talk about our various perspectives on on uh, biraciality, et cetera, and so forth. And what the short of it is, what I think is interesting is that I think there's just been a generational shift that that I think you're pointing to that that for uh, many of us. Uh, I, you know, and and I know that there are differences in terms of how we look. There's certainly a difference in terms of how I look now versus when I was younger. Um, but but the 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 invitation to to a choice, or the invitation to to uh, step away in terms of identity or self identification from blackness, I think has only increased and been made mm-hmm. more open. Uh, and I think it's not done for some utopian, let's appreciate our background purpose. It's done to dissolve black unity and potential black radical struggle. Uh, and one of the things I remember learning mostly from that that research and that that particular article and, and then subsequent work after that, uh, from particularly again from Jared Sexton and Raylena Joseph, uh, the two who primarily introduced this to me, uh, is that that it's it's white women who had children with black men who in the 90s primarily started to really push the biracial category because they wanted their children but not connected to the black community so again it wasn't done for some i want you to fully appreciate your background it was done because of some specific disinterest in having those children be connected to the community. In other words, they wanted the 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 relationship with the 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 father, the man. Yeah. yeah, not the community. Uh, so so. Uh, anyway, so from that, and then the the shift to today, there was one. There was a study that I found uh, um, uh, during that. I think it was during that where where. So this would have been around 2011 or 12. I think somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah, 2011 the, is the year you published yeah. it. Yeah. So there was a new, there was a, a recently published study that showed at that time, and I think it's, it's, I don't know where it would be today, but at that time they were arguing that more people who were so-called biracial were passing as black than as attempting to pass as white or biracial. Mm-hmm. In other words, that the, so, so my individual experience was being reflected more. That is that, 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 because again, that's why I titled the saying a black man, the white mother, mm-hmm. that there was not this idea that, right, it's right, not that right. I, like Dream Hampton said in that, in that piece, I've always remembered her point when she said, me calling myself black was no more a denial of my white mother than me calling myself a feminist is a denial of my male father. And I like the hell way of she a put statement. That. Yeah, it's the hell of a statement. Yeah, yeah. And I like yeah. the way she put that. And I and I and I and I've borrowed that in in, my, in, in trying to summarize my own experience in in in, dis, in discussing how I see myself and how I feel like I have been seen and and acted upon in this society. Now, getting older, losing my hair, getting lighter, marrying a Panamanian, and going to Panama, where the one drop rule is inversed. I mean, all of this for me has changed over mm. the years. Like, there's a lot of like, like you know, because down there, one drop of white means you're white. Right. 
you know, so so it's it's a whole it's a whole you know, and then they have their own set of problems with with yeah. colorism and race. Uh, uh, so anyway, but that's a whole other you know. Yeah. But yeah, but yeah. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, but the, the short of it is um, uh, um, that what I think has happened now there has been this increased invitation, as I was saying to have people identify uh, in any number of ways outside of blackness. And I think that is, is um, uh, I don't know to what extent that, that there are people gathering in halls with cigars and putting this together or, 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 or exactly, you know, or, you know, or, or how else, how else this zeitgeist is being disseminated and, and changed. But it, it seems whether it's just the prominence of, even beyond the percentages of actual interracial marriages, we're seeing more mm -hmm. um, images of interracial couples, oh, uh, particularly even white men with black women in commercials absolutely. and movies yeah. And, yeah. And, and in all kinds of places. And and I think that this is all being done to 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 complicate uh, even more questions of race, uh, uh, white supremacy. Um, uh, identity struggle, black struggle, uh, and and um, so anyway, I you know at the time what I was what I was wanting to do and what I had always thought that my part of my contribution in, into this struggle would be is to remind folks that uh, 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 you know race is is being not only constructed and and deployed but played against us even within our own communities. And that none of us should invite or accept invitations uh, away from, even if it goes against our own personal biases or experience. You know, so so in other words, I've had so-called mixed people talk to me, you know, say, well, you know, I don't have a relationship with the black community. I like my white friends. I like and I'm always saying, but that's irrelevant in terms of the political, how you politically mm -hmm. position yourself. I mean, this is not I'm not. I'm not interested right. in your right. private life like that. I don't really care like that. But and, and your personal experience with your white friends or partners is irrelevant in terms of how race and your identity or my identity is being played against a black struggle or a black community that is being oppressed. And it doesn't matter if no black people like you. <laughs> That's irrelevant. That 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 is that has yeah. no bearing yeah. on on an objective analysis. So so you know I I mean anyway I brother I I, I I think we I think we really <coughs> need to explore this at some point because there's a class dimension that yeah. that's emerged since uh, the 70s. So that there's a link in which um, biracial people, particularly those with white mothers advance in the society mm. and come out of an experience that is different than previous generations of mixed children in that they're, they're, they're growing up in suburbs away from black communities mm -hmm. and move up in this society in ways that previously didn't happen for any black person. But at any rate, we, we, we don't have time to ex explore sure, sure, that. Sure, sure, sure. So I, I want to get to uh, two other questions. And, and, and one is simply to say that that piece that you wrote for the Black Scholar, which uh, was my last issue with, with the Scholar, uh, New Apartheid, Media Consideration in Black America. And, and, and what I'm struck by is that we live in a moment in which while it's 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 highly contradictory, right? Black poverty is 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 massive. Uh, the black middle class has shrunk, um, but we have five or six billionaires and two hundred and thirty five thousand black millionaires. And I'm thinking about uh, Robert Abbott putting together the Chicago Defender. Um, you know, whatever we say about Johnson Publications. In the years that LeBron Bennett edited Ebony, you had some major pieces in there, right? That's a good point. And Jet covered everything. That's a good and point. And then, of course, there was uh, Negro Digest that became Black World with Ho Hoyt That's Fuller. Right. So That's that right. there was a Black capitalist class that did produce good 
provide good things. Even Robert Johnson um, gave us Emerge. Yeah. Uh, how is it that we got these people with great wealth and we're seeing the lessening in terms of black media ownership? Well, on the one hand, I think so. So part of it is is that the wealth you're describing at on on the one hand on the one end of the black community is more than outweighed by the increase in poverty and and uh, the the widening of the gap in income and wealth for the majority going in the other direction. So so yeah, there are more black millionaires and billionaires now than ever, but there's also uh, 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 the same or or an in, same right, right. or an increased percentage of poverty in in the black community on the other end. So it's just it's just a uh, um, anyway. The other thing is that I think that is is in this new media environment, there has been even an even increased or greater consolidation of ownership of yeah. that media, so even from when I wrote that article. And it's funny. Yeah. First of all, yeah. it was an honor to write have an article published in your edit under your editorial ship. Uh, yeah, thank uh, you. And thank seriously, you. and then the other thing was what I thought was funny is that years later I ended up one of the people one of the I, I cited a dean of the Annenberg School in that in 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 that article. Uh, and, and wherever he ended up, I ended up applying to his, to something he was, and I, and I mentioned to him, I said, by the way, you, you know, I said something like you should, you should hire me obviously. Cause I cited you in my work even before I knew I'd be <laughs> applying here. Apparently he didn't think it was funny. I never even heard back, but, but yeah. <laughs> was, I thought it was funny. <laughs> I thought it was an interesting way to get you yeah. know get my name you know recognized in, on the pile of applications, but you know anyway anyway, yeah. um, but but even since then you know like this is one of the things that continues I think to confuse some that yes there is all this wonderful technology and blah 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 yeah. but it's it's the, the people that own it and 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 really the at the institutional investment level like at the BlackRock and Vanguard level there's mm -hmm. really only really very few people owning all of this. Um, and then they hire all the same people. They bring all the same, uh, uh, you yeah. know, ideas. And so there's not a lot. So, so even, so this is sort of the point, uh, uh, cause I know you're going to ask about the buying power thing. This is a similar argument in the yeah, sense that, yeah. that you can't tell black people to do better with their money when whatever it is that they would want to purchase is already owned. Uh, and would require people to be willing to sell and give away power. And that's just not how it works. So, uh, uh, um, so much of the media that we enjoy uh, or don't is owned yeah. by people and entities who only want to own it so that they can muddy up the conversation. Sure. They're not even doing it for money. Um, it, it, the, so the idea yeah. that black people would be invited in to take over ownership and then use that media in some wildly different way is just fantasy. It's just not, even if there was a political will among that class yes. of black elite, they wouldn't be able to do, uh, uh, you know. So like people were trying to say, just real quick, I know people they are still trying to say that Bill Cosby only got in trouble recently oh. because of his years ago effort to buy NBC. Yeah. This, just, this yeah. just came up in one of my classes yeah. two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I said, first Man. of all, he tried to buy NBC decades ago. And then second of all, they don't need to, they they because they already remember the, the, the conspiracy theory then was they killed Ennis because he was yeah. trying to yeah. buy NBC. Yeah. So I was like, they already used that. You can't keep bringing up this <laughs> conspiracy to get rid of everything that happens to him. And and and, and my point was is also that that they don't need to prevent him, they don't need to 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 imprison right. him or kill his kid to prevent him from buying. What they don't just don't have to sell them. They just right. have to say no. He can't make them give it to him, well, even let, if he let, could let, afford it. Anyway, let, let's sorry. put I'm it sorry. this way: yeah. <laughs> Bill Cosby might have been able, might have been able to buy CBS or NBC back in the eighties or nineties, right. whenever he was trying. But no black person could buy one of these things now because of the way they're capitalized. So I mean, it's, it's just for now, but. My point was to say the Chitlin circuit worked. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Chrisman and Hare and Alvin Ross started the Black Scholar in 1969 with no money. 
Why is it that there's such an integrationist impulse amongst uh, the black intellectuals today? That the you know people are running to publish with with these white uh, entities, even the startups they flock to, as opposed to you know I want to sound like uh, the nation, but goddamn, do for self, because at some point. We, we're going to find ourselves in a situation where we have less control over social institutions than we've had at any other point in our existence in this society. And you and I both know, and everyone should know, that that's not going to end well for us. Even in, 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 if I remember correctly, even in Jonathan Fenderson's book about Bob Johnson. Yeah. Uh, or, or about Hoyt Ho- Fuller, it's about, about, Hoyt, Hoyt Fuller. about Hoyt Fuller, but in the in the yeah, part we're talking Johnson's about, about yeah. not not I'm sorry, not Robert Johnson, not I Robert, mean, not, Robert, not, Robert, not Robert, not John H. John H. John H. Johnson. John H. Johnson. John H. Johnson. Yeah. My bad, I'm wrong. No, no, in brother, his book you about both Hoyt, of us. <laughs> yeah, in his book about Hoyt Fuller and his section about John H. Johnson, he's talking about how outside the building. Of, of of the 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 Ebony and Jet offices or whatever, there's black people in the streets organizing. They're they're rallying. They're 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 demanding that he do something with his publication. And yeah. I think that scene Please. is what comes to mind to answer your question. It goes back to even your point about uh, um, uh, the scholarship in the '80s and '90s versus before. The 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 distance from grassroots organized radical struggle in the streets is i think probably the biggest difference i mean it's the biggest difference in terms of everything that i think has gone wrong with with our our our, our supposed athlete leaders or or our popular activists today is all of this it, it's the distance from that kind of uh, uh you know grassroots push um and I think that's 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 what it is. And then, of course, it's the appearance that everybody has, a, you know, a, a YouTube channel and a podcast and a blog. So it's this idea that that we don't I, I think there's this, you know, even when people ask questions about what we're trying to do with BPM, that it's the, I think some don't fully appreciate the 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 importance of collective organized work. Um, and and uh, are invited into mm-hmm. you know being uh, excited to say well I can just start my own and we can all start our own we don't need and then the last thing is is that even black especially black people with money know more than anybody else that black people don't have the money that the black people with money want to make yeah. so to really make money you have to have white investment and support right. Right. so they know that they cannot be propping up black media outlets that would do something in you know truly black and alternative uh if because they want to attract that money that's why the black news channel with all respect is you know billionaire owned and you know republican owned Mm -hmm. and corporate funded Mm -hmm. i mean that's 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 the point. You can't anyway. So, so even black people with money know the reason they got money is 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 through some yeah. proximity to white money, and to get more money, they need even more proximity to more white money. That's so. That's what I think. Um, in a nutshell, is 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 the problem. So let's uh, let me ask you this last uh, kind of question. And and that is, you spent the last couple of years really pointing out the fallacy in how some of us think about economics, and you've ex, you know you you've done a very good job of exposing the myth of black entrepreneurship, right? Uh, how is it that this piece still lingers? I mean, I think a seminal moments, right? Abram Harris's The Negro Capitalist, uh, Earl of Fari Hutchison's piece on uh, the myth of black myth capitalism, of black capital. mm-hmm. right? Black way in capitalist America. And your piece is in that lineage. And it's the most recent. And it does a very good job of making the distinct, you know, how, uh, even some black radicals think that the black income is the equivalent of a national gross 
gross national product. I mean, it's <laughs> can can you help me here? Well, well, you know, there's a couple. There's a lot of things happening here. First of all, first of all, I appreciate you saying I'm in that lineage. I don't quite see it that way, it, 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 and it's not just an, it, it, some attempted at false humility. It's because the the the, the profound. There are differences in the in the overall uh, um, scope of their work, you know. Yeah. yeah. What no, what 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 they were really doing, Harris and and Ofari and 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 Allen and, and you know what they were really doing is analyzing the whole broad economic societal colonial picture, and they were really you know knocking you know and 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 exposing the bigger you know. I was right, really right. trying to just take one little sliver. Uh, that does have to touch on some of those same themes, but yeah, yeah it, it but, touches on those themes for sure. So, so look, I, I, I'm this semester for the first time I'm getting to teach the book to students at Morgan State, which oh, is great. which is fascinating, and it's also a little bit humbling in terms of what I have think I think we all need to do, and I have to do maybe in another subsequent work, which I don't, <laughs> I don't know how it's going to happen or when, but. Because there's so much that I think the book that my work expects or would need to have um, understood going in uh, that that many of us, particularly younger folks, don't even have. Uh, there's so much that has to be done to explain so many of the the basics of how the economy works, what capitalism is. What, what what how this thing has been set up yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and then the piece that's most important to me really is not even the economics but how the media system and the propaganda and the messaging has been delivered yeah, yeah. that yeah. that so there's so much that so so we're starting from such a um and then as you know uh so much of the 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 uh, uh history of black economic critique or black left economic critique has just been stripped out of yeah even in some cases, black studies. So oh, it's like, like it's not in black studies. Oh yeah, it's been, well, absolutely. I mean, you've you made know, this point. Rem, rem, you know, there's there's the renegades, you and I, and uh, you know, and, and another hundred folk. But yeah. So so you take all of that and then you put it together with this incredibly well organized and funded propaganda psychological warfare apparatus that is constantly telling people. I mean, and everybody's got something to say. You got, I mean, and it doesn't matter whether it's Spike Lee doing commercials about cryptocurrency, whether it's Jim Jones Ooh. doing stuff. It, it's it's like, or whether it's it's honestly some of our, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 Bill Harper, your guy. Yeah, well, that, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, but he, even he, historically, he I mean, whether it's, I mean, and then even people, and and whether, never mind what I think or don't think of them, but but people like you know, uh, uh, Juanza Kunjufu and Amos Wilson and Minister oh, Farrakhan yeah, yeah. and Boyce Watkins, yeah. Malcolm X at one point. Yeah. I mean, so many people on this one issue have Du Bois and Garvey, which is to me the funniest part of the whole Ooh. thing. Like this is one thing they definitely agreed on. <laughs> like, they yeah, were like, yeah, at least yeah. at one point, at least at one at point. one point before one the thirties. Yeah, yeah. Before yeah. The, that's right. That's right. That's right. And before that's I, and that's what got me in trouble with some of my other friends because I tried to point that out that that's one area Amos Wilson misreferences oh. Du Bois on that issue in his black uh, 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 in his um, blueprint for blueprint for black power. So it's it's this there is this powerful arrangement of people who unwittingly and honestly are just making a mistake and people who right. are intentionally saying, you know, and then you have the whole commercial black press that is intentionally concocting yeah. the mythology so they could get ad revenue. It's yeah. insane. So there's yeah. it's 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 like I'm sitting here in my classes and some days I'm sitting there just laughing like. There's, it's like I don't even know. Like there's, there's so much that has to be done. Uh, um, uh, so that's why, that's why you know, even when I had fantasies, I was like, like you know, you, you have moments yeah, of, of grandeur. You're like, okay, the book's coming out. They're gonna have to deal with this, and now we're gonna give. We're gonna see. Yeah. It's just so they could just push it aside and then yeah. come out with more mythology and just ignore yeah. it. I mean, it's just so crazy. So it's like. And then, and honestly, anyway, I should have known better because people to, who try to make bigger pronouncements about what's going on in the world have have this happened to them in far worse ways. But it's just that's how, man. I, you know, uh, uh, um, 
You know, I mean, I, I, obviously I kind of understood some of that, but 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 we, we got to try and unpack some of this. So one okay. of the things about the black power media is the notion of beginning to collaborate on the academic end. We have to begin to develop research teams and we've got to yeah. put together a group of people on a project, right? Because we're not going to make headway because in, in this moment, more than any other moment, they found a group of what I'll call pseudo-radical, pseudo-Black nationalist folk who write on these subjects, and much of the writing is shallow, but it's in, it's in a kind of language that uh, has an appeal, mm -hmm. um, and they choose to promote that stuff. And, you know, so we, we, we've, we've got to combat it. We've got to find a way to combat it. I so think your I'm idea, but I ahead. think the research team, is, I just want to say, I think that's a great idea. And I would love to see, you know, we're, at BPM, we're still trying to figure out, uh, um, and, and admittedly, we, I, well, I, from, I speak for myself, we're struggling with, I think, some some organizational capacity. Um, but but uh, uh, one of the things we are trying to do is identify projects for us to, to try to fund and support. Uh, and I think this would be, this should definitely be on the table. That is a, 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 a collectively targeted research project of some kind that yes. maybe we could all publish. Uh, because I think you're you're exactly right. I mean, the the, the task here, again, I've been very much humbled. You know, I, I you know I've been in terms of in terms of uh, my my capacity to produce work, my mm. my capacity to produce um, the kind of work that would impact in the way that I would want it to, uh, and and to to to. to uh, uh, develop the answers that I think we that we all need. It's very hard to do for me. It's been impossible to do by myself. I cannot do it. I don't even pretend to think so. So I would very much like to see us follow up on 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 that idea, even here at BPM and beyond. Obviously, that's then, a great then, idea. Then we 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 absolutely will. We absolutely will. All right, right. Uh, on. As I'm as I'm looking into uh, the chat, there's not uh, a lot of questions, and I think that's probably because. People are so familiar chat. with you. Okay, um, good. But there, there is a there's there's Marie a Antoinette and Sarah Nicholas. Yeah, I'm not sure what that. I'm not. I, I don't know the context of that comment. I'm not sure what that means. Yeah, I, or, I don't either. That's right. <laughs> now there is a, 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 a. This is more informational, but. A lot of the uh, the classic black texts, um, they've put these exorbitant prices on. So uh, Leah Boggs is is telling us that uh, Afari's "The Myth of Black Capitalism" is on Amazon for nine hundred dollars. Wow! Yeah. Um, the, wow. Um, That's crazy. Yeah. Who needs uh, the Negro? That you know that classic text. Who needs the Negro? It talks about automation, yeah. uh, taking yeah. jobs from left. That's that's like nine hundred dollars too. A large number of that stuff. I mean, shit. I think I might have paid uh, seventy five dollars to get a collection of uh, James Foreman's uh, writing, political thought of James Foreman, the collection of essays that he did uh, through the League of Black Revolutionary mm. Workers Press. I mean, uh, they've put these astronomical prices on our classics. So, you know, it, it would be good if we could find a way to get that stuff redone by Black Classic Press. Hey, or I don't a, mean to. Cost. <laughs> hey, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how that works, uh, but we should put the, I don't know what, what Paul uh, or, uh, uh, or the capacity over there uh, at, 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 at BCP is for that, but. Uh, that's crazy, uh, yeah, the, yeah. and 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 Ofari's book is, I mean, not that size is everything. No, but no, that's no, a small it's, book, it's, man. it's a small book. Well, Leah just put in that uh, it's now down. You can get it for a hundred and fifty-four dollars. But again, I mean, that's back crazy. in the day, I think that might have been twelve dollars back in the day. It, uh, no, there, there. In 2021, man, no book should be that much money. 
Right. Honestly, the, the 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 hard copy of of my book is sixty dollars. That's too much money. I'm glad you yeah. get the PDF for free. That's too much. I, I don't and I don't make money off of that. So it's like why that's it, it, it. anyway. There should be no. We got people who who look. I'm telling you, that's why even Aaron Schwartz was pushed to suicide because underneath all of underneath that whole case of Aaron Schwartz was here's a white kid who comes from a middle class background who exposed the the corporate colonial uh, capture of uh, our uh, 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 intellectual work of the collective's mm -hmm. intellectual work and his attempt to 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 level that playing field is what caused him ultimately his life uh so i think that that yeah. unfortunately this is consistent uh yeah no that's 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 definitely the terrain where we're we're playing it so i'm i'm sc scrolling through and um okay this is hey. people uh yeah there's not a lot of Hmm. I don't know. I'm scared. Like I said, I'm scared of the chat. I don't know. Uh, no, you don't need to be scared of it, brother. They, they love you. <laughs> I'm like you. Um, what the hell were we saying at 8.05 that Marie Antoinette and Zara Nicholas came up? The only at thing I can, I I, I, the only thing I can remember is that uh, the French knew how to make a revolution. Man, so let's, let's just be crazy. So but sure, are sure. You, are you disturbed by how you can live in a society that made a revolution? Uh, 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 you know, Jerry Horn says it's a counter revolution, but wh whatever. They, 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 they broke with a colonial power, a king, and they created a society based on republicanism and not the divine right uh, of, of, of kings. But have you ever seen a society? That just worships some motherfuckers uh, <laughs> who, who have prince and, and duke and duchess behind their name. How do you account for a society that made a bourgeois revolution against an aristocracy that is trying to crawl back on the, 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 the goddamn castle grounds? What, what kind of place are we in, man? I, you know, I. I, I Look, it was one group of rich whites that didn't want to pay any more money to another group yeah, of rich whites. Right. Underneath that was more in common than, you know, than anything else. And and they, you know, so obviously they didn't want to set up something that was truly different from that. They just wanted to have their own access to that throne. Uh, but, but in many ways know, it was so, in many ways it was okay. different. Because okay. uh, there, there, there's not the divine right of inheritance, right? You got to at least go out and and you know and commit genocide and and and, and oh steal, well, yeah. As opposed to you just get it because you're born into it, and, well, and you but, have divine but, right. You and you and you have divine right. I mean, I'm, I'm 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 just trying to make the point that it was a break with a kingship, though yeah, it would but, recreate. But, through capital, right? But but capitalism is different from feudalism in, in, in that sense. But my point is that black folk are also on that king and queen shit. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I joke all the time. I you know, like I, I like 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 I, I just know that that at the long at the end of the long line of my father's people, my people were working somewhere. They were yeah. they were cleaning something, fixing something, building. So they were doing the work. So I don't yeah. I. So I, I respect all the kings and queens, and I I like to think of ourselves. We all you know above our station in life, whatever, whatever. But I just you know shout out to the to the to the to the African laborers back in the day that was just yeah. doing that work because that's who I feel like in my that's my bloodstream. So I don't know, but 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 to your point though. Yes, I, yes. Capitalism and, and feudalism and, and, are different, and the monarch and the monarchy and all that are different. But yeah. there is still that that initial accumulation yeah. 
uh, that requires all the violence, right? And absolutely. the genocide absolutely. and the slavery. Absolutely. And then once the wealth is accumulated, the similarities start to come back in where at least, so no, we don't have a king yeah. and a queen and a divine right, but certainly the elite and the white elite in this society feel that they are divinely in, 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 the, in the right to inherit wealth and to accumulate as much yeah. and to, 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 without working for it, et cetera, and so forth, that, that it's their right to it. Um, and, and certainly and then, at this yeah. moment, they've decided to uh, remove uh, the veil. Hmm. And they're saying, yeah. uh, you, you know, uh, we don't need uh, the pretense of democracy anymore. No. And in fact, and in some ways, um, with some some intelligent rebranding and reframing, they're able to 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 get people to. Ins well, yes and no, because 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 even as we're talking, there's around the country right now, um, huge labor unrest strikes mm -hmm. all over the place. Uh, um, uh, uh, various forms of unrest and and rebelliousness happening. So so on this, on some level, the propaganda isn't working. Uh, right. uh, um, but on another level, there is still a, a, this this enough of it being successful to to get enough of the population, even to say, for instance, uh, um, with excitement, look at these billionaires going into space. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I still think it's funny. I, I I can't take credit for this idea, or but I still think it's interesting to note that that. If you read his website carefully, Bezos is say, is not saying we're going to space so the rich can escape a dying earth. He's saying we're going to send working people into space to find what we need to make earth down here livable for, for, for the elite. <laughs> so it's 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 anyway. So it, I, I, I say all that to say that that uh, there is this intense struggle to uh, uh, propagandize people enough to keep them at bay, but to maintain that same sense of we deserve what we have, yeah, yeah. Uh, even if we have, you know, even if Bezos can say, uh, uh, what is it, 300 billion he's worth now? I don't even know yeah, what it is. Some, like, yeah, some yeah, crazy, yeah, well. like, you know, like he, that, 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 that somehow we're supposed to applaud that. Uh, and be thankful that that his ex wife will come to 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 HBCUs and drop a couple million. Uh, you yeah. know, I mean, it's it's you know, it's like, literally uh, pennies for them. Yeah. What is yeah? What would forty million dollars? She gave Morgan Morgan State forty million. What would that What would that be? To, Out of three hundred billion. Yeah, or or whatever yeah. her her slice yeah. of his yeah whatever her slice of it was, but still a couple hundred billion. What is you know what's forty million dollars? Would you right. like you you know? Would you even notice it was gone? No, you yeah. would not. Yeah. Um. You know, you were first of all, it's a write off. So so let's get, let's that's be clear too, about yeah. that. Right. Right. That helps right. them pay no taxes. Um. But yeah, I, I I do think that we need to really take on the king and queen argument in a in a historical fashion. So, you know, one of the things that I try and push is that most of the ethnic groups that end up in the U.S. and in, uh, in, and in the West are not from the kingdoms. The kingdoms right. was capturing us. We were in the stateless societies where they were pure democracy. Mm. Well, you mm. know, with, with, of course, the caveat that while African women had much had more rights and wielded more power in African mm -hmm. societies than any other group of women, they still mm -hmm. were oppressed, mm -hmm. right? Um, but th that's where we're from. Those stateless societies and a mm -hmm. more democratic tradition, we're not from the kingdoms, but yet there's that gravitation to that foolishness. So any rate. No, I think it's, I, I, I mean, I think you raise a good point. And I do think in a broader context, it, it is sort of a, a part of that anti-labor propaganda yeah. that why, you know, why wouldn't we be equally proud of our African heritage that was, you know, 
just the regular folks. Like, why, yeah. you know, it, so if we weren't kings and queens, we deserve this? Is that what you say? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> but it's, but, it, but I think it's like part of that anti labor, like, you can't find uh, um, uh, solace or confidence or inspiration in, in, in being a working or just a regular, so called regular person. Uh, we would we had to be the king and the queen. So who was yeah. everybody else? Like what yeah. was you know? Um, yeah, but I like I, you know, line. there's a line in the, one of uh, the Coos songs. Boots Rally uh, is talking to his his his, uh, his daughter, and he's uh, basically the, the the riff is wear clean draws because things might fall the wrong way, right? Hmm. But he's telling her that uh, tell your teacher that. Queens did kill people. How you think they got all their money? And then, right. you know, and that's the message we need to send as opposed to trying to tell little kids they princesses and princes. No, cut that bullshit. No, you know, I I've never known a bourgeoisie or a aristocracy that created culture. And particularly in terms of African Americans, mm. the culture that, that matters for us was not mm. created by uh, the bourgeois sector of our community. It was mm. created by the working class people. Blues, mm. jazz, hip hop. Mm. Um, That's a good point. Just tell me what the, what the bourgeoisie created in that regard. I don't have an answer for that. I wouldn't have it. That's a good point. Yeah. So, <laughs> we still don't have any questions, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know hey, what's going on. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, you know, maybe we we we've 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 given everybody what they need. Uh, I, I suspect that that's the case because they're saying good things. We got four minutes, uh, so any last comments that you can uh, conclude with? That's about two minutes for you to do very easy i appreciate uh your work i appreciate your show i appreciate the conversations you have and i appreciate being uh now part of of the the list of those conversations uh, uh i think this is this is great um and I, I like i said i appreciate it and i hope that um i don't know i just hope we can continue to grow here at bpm so, you know, like I said, I, I, cause I think th this kind of work and these kinds of conversations are essential. They don't happen nearly enough. Uh, and, uh, uh, anyway, so I, I'm just appreciative. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. We, we, we've got probably another two minutes we can spare and sure. Saint, sounds of St. Elsewhere reminded me that he did have a question and All I right. found the question and the question is this. What do y'all think of Preston Smith's observation that black politics in the U.S. has usually had two distinct thread, trends in its uh, types of demands? I don't think it's Preston Smith. I think it's uh, this is a political scientist. I think it's Charles Smith. Mm. But the argument is the argument that is generally associated with Harold Cruz, that there have been two traditions. It's in a crisis of Negro intellectual, but note. Uh, now, I don't like this guy, but uh, Augie Meyer raises that question, makes that, a, makes that statement in his book on the age of Booker T. Washington. So Cruz, uh, I doubt that he came up with it independently. But the, the two trends is nationalism and integrationism. You want to respond to that? So the, the, what do I think about those two trends? The, the, is that no, the no, question? No, or the, 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 those being the, the two dominant? That, that, that those are the two distinct trends in black politics. For some reason, I want to, I, for some reason, my initial reaction is to think, are those the only two distinct trends? I agree I, with I, you. I feel, I feel I like there are other it. trends. <laughs> yeah. Um but uh, I mean, I, th I think broadly speaking, I mean, you know, on some level, I, look, I don't know. I, 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 on some level, the 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 conditions here have and continue to be uh, in, uh, 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 horrific, traumatic, and in some ways complicated. So I think that mm -hmm. the responses 
whether I like them or not, have been in many ways logical um, to the situation. So, uh, 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 but I do think it's a little more complicated than that. Yeah. Um, so I'm not, but I'm not familiar with the, with, the, with, 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 with the, the origins of that particular claim or, or why that would be, I mean, I'm, 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 in other words, I'm familiar with those two historical trends, but in terms of the claim that those are the dominant trends or the only trends, I'm not, and, 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 and Smith's work, I'm not familiar okay. with, or I don't remember. So I, I don't, so I'll leave it. I'll defer to you on that one. Well, I'm, I'm familiar with Smith's work and I, and I love Smith's work, but, um, there's more than two trends and, and, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, okay. Our struggle is much more complicated and we have a minute. So uh, my brother, I'm going to remove you and I'm going to sign off, but I right, am honored. Thank you nah, so man, much. Honor is mine. Thank you very much. And thanks everybody for watching. Okay. This has been uh, real talk with Dr. Suniata tell you a history as a weapon for liberation, for black liberation. And our guest today was the magnificent Dr. Jared Ball. So I am signing off.